would you talk about uh, the avoidance of darkness, the avoidance of light? <clears throat> the word avoidance. Yeah. yeah. Who avoids what? Yeah. Right. Can you avoid? Right. So can you avoid? There's something you can avoid. I think that's really what we're asking. Yeah. What avoids? Yeah. Who avoids? Yeah. Yeah. Recently, we've been talking about the obviousness of what it is, so in a bigger picture sense. Yeah. So we're talking about fear as basis for avoidance. So some people have no choice but to be preoccupied with their own stuff until it's it is known in the Far East teachings, the seeds of karma have to be burnt, see, purified. Then you can move on. Therefore, I keep referring to this process as a step. Keep taking steps. If it is relatively valued as a step towards the darkness, so be it. It's another step. Right? At this level, who cares? The idea is, of course, you have to take your steps before you're ready. See? You're ready to stop taking steps, so to speak, and then maybe that becomes a step. When you stop taking steps, that's another step. Yeah. When you stop going one way or the other, to the light or to the dark or somewhere else. See. When you stop going at all, see. when you stop going, you just stop. Yeah. Practice then is accepting the obviousness of the power of stillness. Yeah. Let's say the stillness of the heart, a phrase that's used in the traditions. See, the heart of stillness, silence is, is that. See. Everything else is predisposition, inclination, drive, desire, programming towards something else. See, a thing, maybe a movement outside into the external world, distracted by a thing. Mm. But it's not as easy as a snap, because <clears throat> we're talking about that thing being not so much self-created, but blood generated, which means probably goes back down the line, and that's the, what gives it its power and drive. Thing. So it's easy to say, I'm going to stop drinking. But can you? Will those spirits see, who drink in your blood psychically give you the freedom or opportunity to do that? Sometimes they will. Most of the time it's hard. If, as it is said, you're an older soul, then it's easy for you to appear to be controlling the situation. You have more options once you've had so much experience that you're tiring from experience. You're preparing to shed the skin of experience and be naked and open <clears throat> to stop programming, stop programming. See? Cessation is that's called. So these are, I think, points that have to do with the topic of who avoids what. See? Can you avoid? Can you avoid practice? Which is a good, a good question. Can you avoid enlightenment? Don't think so. It's everything. It's, it's everything. It's you. Your limits, your programs, everything. See? It's you. Which means that that kind of recognition or insight that it's you which is basic responsibility for your being, then that helps you to see that what it is, in terms of wisdom, is, is accepting you as you are already, the as it is. So you gotta, you gotta get to that point. And then we have to abandon the idea that there's something else to avoid, because then that's thinking. There's something else to avoid. This is programming. See, the programming of avoidance or separation, self-created separation or separativeness. Then it's who, that's why I said who, and then what, or what, in terms of who. See? The idea is to get to the center, the core, as quickly as possible, regardless of what the perceived karma is, so that we can start to get busy, get busy transcending it by understanding the potential of the moment and the depth that that really implies at this point, heartfulness. And when we get to that precipice, then there's a certain kind of systematic collapse of the programs. 
uh, something that could come close to this kind of cessation or catastrophe where you, you start to give up programs. It's like falling in love, let's say, uh, or touched by some, some kind of like uh, heart impulse right? that causes you to open, and you open, you forget, you forget the neuroses, you know, right? In the middle of war, you see something beautiful, and you stop, you say, wow, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen this before. Huh? Or I saw this face, this child. Right? Right? So in that moment, you, you, you transcend. You forget. That means you're beyond that already. Your programs are not, not important. So they are mock-ups of reality that we allow to encase us and uh, determine where and how we go down the path of life. I mean, step by step. So understanding that, we're going to be prepared to say, no, but all of it's just programming. Again, it can't go for everyone that quickly. But that's an insight into the real nature of it. And that's what's been taught, demonstrated by many of the masters, who are here not to manipulate anybody or control anybody, but show that they have some insight of what it is in terms of the creative cycle that inevitably winds up in peace. And so behavior, and programming, and watching these things, what you avoid, and for what reason, if you can find a reason. Some people avoid racial issues, right? Some people avoid sexual issues. Some people avoid, avoid political issues and religious issues or artistic issues, uh, freedom issues, war issues. A lot of people are avoiding them, but are they avoiding them as if it's a conscious act or are programs more or less being manifested through their, their body-mind as part of the ancestral influence, which sometimes is more powerful than the self itself. See, a lot of people think they have ideas. Well, they have to look more deeply where that idea comes from. Anybody in your family line have similar ideas? And do you know that for sure? See? So we're being used. First thing we need to know before we get into practice is what you're being used by. See? What are you being haunted by? What are you being possessed by? What are you being obsessed by? What are you fixating on? These are things that go back deep. Early life in some cases and then beyond that. And some things may show up all of a sudden from an ancient incarnation. All of a sudden you're in your midlife and you thought you had it all together and boom, you have to be confronted with something. All of a sudden the East, because you're in the West, becomes more attractive to you. You say, wow, I wasn't even interested in this. And all of a sudden, man, <laughs> I'm looking at movies and I'm preoccupied with Korea all of a sudden. <laughs> What's up with Korea? I had no interest. I don't even like Korean food. Karma, time karma, comes up and takes you off your game. It means you have more to complete, more to look at, and that your life is more complicated than you thought. Or you thought on the basis of simply looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, well, that's it. Now I'm looking good. Everything is good. So are we acting oftentimes to serve the needs of our river of blood more than for ourselves? Yes, of course, obviously. Right. Whether that's in terms of satisfying your parents, your relatives, your friends. River of blood is everything. See, everything. It's your friends, it's your value system. See, it's your orientation in life. River of blood is given and you have to adapt to that. Your body is created out of culture. You gotta go back to the womb. What did your mother invest in you? Everything, her emotions, her thoughts, her desires, and opportunity too, right? Opportunity for you to grow into an individual. Right? Because you're a, a unique creation of the, the male and the female, the mom and the dad, so this is part of it. But that is still a veil because the mom and the dad are created creations of the moms and dads ad infinitum, which makes it a little bit more complicated. Okay? And you, you find children in the, uh, the psych, uh, let's say, uh, system, the psychological or the psychiatric system, and they're, they're confused. They're confused. They don't know who they are. They don't know why they don't know who they are. And they have parents and they have people telling them. They have doctors. They have uh, uh, social workers and people and friends telling them. But still, still doesn't reach deep enough. And so again, we have programming that we need by birth to deal with. It's an ordeal. Being born is not easy. You're being human. It's tough. 
but clearing it is tougher. Clearing away the, uh, the darkness of, of who knows relative to karma is tough. See? It's very tough. It's, it's easy to talk about the burn, but it's really hard to obtain the burn. See? The burn is instantaneous upon hearing, release of karma. That's the completion of the burn. Who's that free to let go of something on the spot? See? Not too many people. We need to open to that as a part of our creative process. Methods or ways to support that opening up and letting go? Well, the, uh, the, the idea of opening up is really that direct, opening up and letting go. See? Opening up is the message. <laughs> it is. That's it. Open up and let go. Of course, we, we need consciousness and intelligence that enables us to properly know what that means. Open up and let go of what? Open my legs up, open my arms up, open my ears up, open my eyes up, open my nose up, open my mouth up, open my head up, open my heart up, what, what? When it comes to the Dharma or the wisdom practice, it means everything has to be opened up. It means everything has to be let go of in order to receive that which is beyond what has been polluting you, obscuring you, contracting you, see, confusing you, dividing you conflicting you, afflicting you, see? making you less than your considerations even, less than you imagine yourself to be. See? Yeah. So the Dharma is here for good reason because it is your true nature and it transcends the culturing aspect of it, although ultimately it is also the culturing but not as a problem, not as something that obscures your intelligence and your, your connection with your true nature basic being or your spiritual heart being, free heart being. In, in the course of opening up and letting go, do we inadvertently take on other new karma? Well, it depends on what you mean, new karma. There's plenty of karma that appears new, but is it new? No, it's more the same. Everybody's in the same pool. Everyone is a different version of everybody else at that level. It's just all mechanical machinery. Preferences. You mentioned preferences. Yeah. Preferences. Things that are comforting. Preferences. Limitations. The real word here is limitations. Preferences. Likes and dislikes are limitations. See? Yeah. They're adapted. Yeah. They're taken on. They're assumed they're inherited. And we already have too many of those when it comes to certain things, unless you're cultured in a certain kind of it's a system where the, the, the culturing is to undo culturing. And then culturing's okay. And if you prefer enlightened, let's say, people to unenlightened people for obvious reasons, where there's more healing, there's more love, more light, more happiness, that's understood. The idea, of course, ultimately for people who are gaining from the, let's say, the wisdom works, is to yeah, attain your happiness to share with other people. Don't attain it for yourself. Attain it to share it. And that's how you amplify it. The idea is to amplify it. That's how you expand the awareness with more and more people, and you create a circle where, in there, there are more enjoying, sharing, and communicating the same reality, which is to keep the healing feeling going for everyone, caring for one another, and giving everybody a chance. Even the dark people, you know, the the, the lower spirits that want to destroy everything. You know. Those who fear and fear, like the gun toters, people who can't go out of their houses with several guns on them, like, you know, that's, if that's not paranoid, I don't know what is paranoid. That's not healing, in a sense. Yeah, it's self-protection and defense, yeah, everyone has a right, every animal does that. But how do the angels deal with that? How do the higher spirits deal with it? Jesus never said anything about carrying weapons, nor did the Buddha. They have something else going on. Then it's wisdom that protects you. Enlightenment protects you. See, the heart, the heart in, at its true nature guides you. Come in. Um, does moving towards the heart, I mean, does that create a, a, a ripple effect where it's amplified or does it create a polarizing effect? What do you mean, move, move, explain moving towards the heart? Moving, more, moving towards living from one's heart. Um, is that going to Okay, you're already living from the heart. Now you want to expand that. See, everybody's already situated in what it is, see? so it's not like it's out there. So the, the whole 
conversation based upon duality needs to be burnt, needs to be reduced to, it already is. Now how do you, how do, you do it better? How do you do more of it? So then in the course of opening up, how do we create amplitude of that feeling rather than resistance or, you know? Uh, well, you can create, but then this is not about creating as such. It's not self-effort. It's something that happens in openness, in truth. It's being open to being beyond your idea of what it is. And the paradox is that when you're open beyond your idea of what it is, what it is reveals itself from nowhere. The idea is to create the safe place, free of neurosis and paranoia, so you're not always having to defend yourself and protect yourself from your fantasies and your nightmares. Right? Worst case scenarios, which is what these people are walking around with all these guns. Here, there, <laughs> guns everywhere, guns, socks, pockets. <laughs> Come on, how many guns do you need? How many bullets do you need for what? We have to get rid of that self-defense paranoia. We have to go beyond that. I mean, I think the word some people would use is trust in the spirit. But if everybody's wearing guns, I mean, you don't know who's going to get itchy fingers and start blowing everybody away. So that makes life impossible. And that now the, these you know, people are asking for everybody to carry more guns, right? Uh, it doesn't make sense. I'm not saying it's bad, but what, what's going to be the result? Everybody's going to be in a, in a subway car, right, in New York City, right, packed in there like sardines, feeling each other's guns up against their bodies. Man, what kind of guns are you got? A, what is that you're carrying there? Is that a 45 I'm feeling in my left rib? You got a 38 revolver over there. Is that a shotgun I feel up against my leg? Hey, you got an Uzi? <laughs> AK-47 or whatever, you know, these kinds of weapons. Hey, this guy's got a bazooka over here. Don't mess with him. <laughs> right? And then somebody op opens up their vest and they got all the bombs. So I should say, listen, I've outdone all of you if you mess with me. <laughs> right? This whole, this whole subway goes up. Yeah, no, it gets crazy. It gets nuts. See? Is that one of the reasons that people arm themselves with those, those kinds of defenses and obscurations is, don't mess with me? Of course it is. They're afraid of dying. The whole me message is, I, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I'm afraid of death and I'm not ready to die. I don't know what death is and I'm not ready to die. i got too much to do here. Is that part of what culture transmits, that fear of... Well, obviously, if we're talking about enlightenment culture, it's not about guns. Although enlightenment means awareness of guns and awareness of defense, uh, practical, intelligent, right? you know, use of power. That's reasonable, right? creative, not neurotic, but it's necessary. It's necessary. Discrimination. Discrimination, intelligence, yeah, when the need is there, when there's no other option. No other alternatives, and that's what you have to do, because that's what you're left to do. But everyone's sporting their guns. Uh, it's not, 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 I mean, what kind of mind is that? What does a gun represent in society where everybody's wearing guns and looking at each other with these funny faces? My gun's bigger than yours. My gun is better. My bullets are bigger than yours, so don't mess with me. What kind of attitude is that? I mean, this is like high school, right? competition. Adolescent competition, see, brought to a world scale. And because the government does it, and the cops do it, then we should all be cops. We should all be cowboys and Indians again, so to speak. Good guys and bad guys. That's paranoia. See, fit for the barbarian, not fit for intelligent, conscious beings. Yeah. And that is the mind of self and other. That is the mind of self and other as, better, worse, competition, that's duality at its worst, when everybody's paranoid. Everybody's lost their humor because everybody's already threatened. You're already threatened, you're already defending yourself because you know everybody's authorized to have guns you can't see. Are you afraid to bump into somebody because somebody you bump into is <laughs> fly off the handle, especially if they're a combat vet. Are you bump into a combat vet? Paranoid war, what is this, a war shock? Shocked by war, you know, shell-shocked, uh, uh, let's say, veteran, you're in trouble. Yeah. 
So we need to disarm ourselves see, and become Christians, see, at the least Christians, Buddhists, monks, maybe. But the idea is be intelligent and be willing to create and be productive and be positive see, and negotiate to a certain degree. And see if we can overwhelm this impulse to self-destruct. This, uh, you know, meet your okay corral kind of mentality. Because we don't have intelligence, intelligence enough, reason enough to you know, avoid it. You know. So we just have to carry guns because we're not intelligent enough. The bullets are, and our, our, our IQs is a caliber bullet. Are you suggesting then that the sin, the end result of the self and other mind, that it's possible to see that and drop it then? Well, yes. I mean, even in combat, I mean, combat is not just for destruction. Combat is a situation so that you can see what you're doing and see how fragile your life is. And combat is a situation where you are confronted by life and death in very, very uh, vivid terms. See? And many on the com combat field or battlefield awaken and they say no more. They're done. You know what's he gone? They don't want to see blood, they don't want to see uh, mangled bodies, they don't want to see any of it anymore. See? Because it's so extreme, you just get a blowout. It's like perfect tantra to the extreme. See? Gone beyond, it blows out. No more. And I've had friends who came back from war like that, Vietnam. It's done, man. It's done. So I know. And once it's gone, it can't come back. Well, if it's really gone, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah, it's gone, it's gone. What, what about the more, let's say, concealed weapons in the sense of psychic violence, you know, non-physical violence, which people seem much more free to, uh, uh, you know, put on each other than physical violence? What about it? Yeah. So, you know, is, is, that, is that a further manifestation of the same thing? Or it's the same mechanisms, yeah. Fear mechanisms. We're talking about fear mechanisms that uh, sometimes take on outrageous dimensions. Yeah. I mean, people are so unevolved, see, they're out looking, looking for trouble, they're out looking to command and control other beings. We're talking about very low consciousness here, and very limited consciousness, it's not evolved at all, self-preoccupied, stuck in a small little capsule, there's no breathing, there's no, no life in it, it's like a rat trapped by a cat. And so that's a very low stage. And so we, we need more intelligence, we need more consciousness, we need more education, we need more opportunity, we need more awakeness. We, we need to associate with the enlightened and those who are more creative, see, who want to transform things from pain and suffering and, and limitation to expression and, uh, let's say, uh, beauty, see, more beauty more appreciation for what life as potential is, and what the heart is as potential, compassion and love, you know, and what the mind is as, as uh, intelligence and service, see. seeing better, see, not, not just looking at bodies, you know, as, as a child might, because it's just discovered its body, so it's very body conscious, it's just, it's just recognized it as a nose, and so it's looking at everybody's nose, you got people that stay at that stage, I <laughs> oh man, look at those ears, Look at that penis, look at those breasts, look at those buttocks. My kids, uh, we have to evolve here, get over it. You have an ass, get over it, you have a body. You're alive, come on. We're in the universe, kids, we're in the universe. Right? We have a huge responsibility to be universal beings. Right? Not just kids in the closet, you know, playing with themselves, come on. Is there a pedagogical reason that the, the universe does it this way, that you come up from, say, less developed, is that's how it is. That's nature. Yes, exactly. Evolution, we call it. And you know, if you were talking about flowering, it is blossoming. It's opening. So it's not just physical opening. We, we talked about the chakra system, which is useful. We start at the base, and you come up to the top, and each one is supposed to flower, which means that we have all this potential. We grow into this huge tree, boom, 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 and then it blossoms up here, and you, you have access to enlightenment and higher thought and, and mysticism and, and beauty that comes with that. But it's, it's not about using your hands to kill anybody. It's about seeing the, the magnificence of intelligence. 
see, and creativity in a, in a magnificent way. And sometimes that, that is diverted to, in the case of genius scientists, to weaponry and self-defense because people don't know how to get along with each other. And they don't want to get along with each other because they're too selfish to begin with. They only care about themselves. So they're still in the groin. So there's no growing, there's groin. <laughs> are you growing or are you groin? Oh, you're groin. I can tell right away. You got guns on you. You're total groin. One, one, one uh, genital isn't enough for you, you need seven of them. <laughs> one in every pocket, go ahead. Plain ball. Plain ball too, yes. Yeah. Too much. <laughs> A wrong ball game. Yeah. Right. Uh, come in. So, as, as we begin to awaken and open, uh, should we... Yeah, beyond, beyond child, childhood, beyond adolescence, and having to prove you, mu you got muscles. Oh, look at me. <laughs> You know, I'm pumping iron. <laughs> well, I'm so important. I've bulged two, two uh, centimeters over the past year. Wow, I'm important. Okay, what's next? What else? So at that point, does one return to their family in the river of blood and try to reconstruct it or just go on and let go of it? You have to find the right people, the next step. Let's call it the justice of the next step. That's what we need. Access the justice of the next step, the balance point. What is the next step for the individual to take? Is it doing what everybody else is doing, going from person to person, trying to find something better when they're all the same, they're all wanting to be the same, they're all programmed to be the same, they all look the same, they go to the same barbers, the same hairdressers, same doctors, the same mechanics, same grocery store. <laughs> Where's the difference? Huh? Not very much difference there. So you're just going around the circles. You've got to step up. See? And so then you have to have the understanding that you want to be more than you're showing up as, and more than is around you. I'm not saying that's ambition. I think we could call it vision. Vision of potential. And becoming more and better and of more service, which is also human nature and the dignification process for humans as good spirits. Not just about all this other nonsense, which we love because children have to evolve. And it gives them the liberties. Five year olds, three year olds, you let them get away with certain things because of their age. You say, yeah, you can do that this year, but next year, that's not going to fly. Right? Now you're in school. Now you have to learn how to keep your food on your plate and not fling it. <laughs> you can't do that in school. You're going to get me and your, your father or your mother in trouble. I'm going to have to go up there. You better straighten it out here. I don't want to go up there. <laughs> so this is where having a ferry boat man or a guide is very important. Of what? Having a ferry boat man or a guide to help. That, what, that, what that next yeah. step in the justice is. Yeah, yeah. We, we, need, we need a disposition. We need to awaken our disposition towards spiritual law. I don't mean religious ideas of laws, but a creative law, the law of creation and recreation. We're talking about recreation. Uh, there is a system that we know is in place called finding the right models. See? In the uh, Roman Catholic tradition, they have the saints, They're crazy peeps, but beautiful examples of what their spiritual practice is supposed to be about. We have artists in Hollywood and artists throughout the world which show, show up as examples for peace. Show you how to play instruments, how to sing and carry on, and maybe make a lot of money. For sometimes good reasons, sometimes for not so good reasons. See? So there are models, but then who are the models behind, beyond those models? See, the, the picture, motion picture models, see? the magazine models, who are the real models beyond those? Yeah. And that's what the children need to be made aware of more so. And not to be distracted from the need to, let's say, use somebody as great and um, charismatic as an Elvis Presley, <clears throat> you know, whose music and his heart you know, has reached the world in its own way. And you have these artists that really mean good. I mean, they're maybe not the best of characters, but their music reaches the people. So we need to know, okay, we got the music from this person, but they're not a good human character, so we need to go to human characters that help us to step up. Not just learn how to sing and dance and, and carry on as, as uh, you know, many of the artists do. It has to be more than that because we know the limits of that.
come in. And the stepping up involves greater heart resonance, greater attunement to the heart. Stepping up in involves the vision of your potential and greater attunement, yes, if you can get that way, get to that place. If that arises in you, even better. Some people find it in themselves already, and that's uh, probably the most direct way to have it. Then find the right friends who can inspire you to step up, who care about you and recognize your potential as an individual has much more to offer than you, they, they're doing and offering at the time. Say, yeah, you can do more, you can do better this way. By the way, I have a certain book you might want to look at and buy. You know, start somewhere like that. And offer what works for one person to the next person in terms of improving their humanity, their character, their inner world, say, their practice, and their vision of, uh, say, a higher vision of humanity. So the river of blood sets a kind of limit that we can't see beyond? It sets a tone, not a limit. It sets a tone. See, see, so it sets a tone. And that, that from that tone, whatever it is, let's say it's an income bracket tone, which is not a limit, it's just a tone. Say all the parents, are, they're immigrants from a country, they didn't have much, they have a lot of, lot of spunk, a lot of inspiration, so the potential is there. A lot of the people who become uh, leaders and heroes in this nation, great nation, start out as you know people who are right at the base level. Right? Start at the base, but have a vision that they can come up, and so they work their way up there. So the idea is to have a vision. And ask someone for a vision. Ask your parents for a vision. Ask your uncles and aunts for a vision. What's a good vision for me? You don't have to buy a line hook, hook and sinker, but you can hear what they have to say, because it is your blood. Maybe your blood has an insight for you, as my blood had many insights for me. So by emulating good deeds or, let's say, good spirits, how, how far will that get us? Before That's a good that question. That's really up to the individual. Okay. You, have, um, you have peace workers throughout the world, you know, for graduates of college, missionary work. And it's really, it depends on how much you are willing to do, not so much for anybody else. See? So what, 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 let's say, the opportunities are that you get along the way. A lot of people get to go into the college programs, and it's when they come upon a specific topic at a certain time in their progression, even though they're going through college crazies and getting drunk or stoned or whatever, going through their wildness stage, uh, that they come upon something that resonates with them and their ancestry. And this, hmm, yeah, I'm taking this now, I'm looking at it more, and they go off. See, so here we're talking about children, people. Take time to be alone. So being with the peeps is great act, action, activity, social activity, but it's a compromise. If you can't find your inner voice, if you don't have any access to anything real inside yourself, then try, try and keep that in mind when you're socializing with peeps, because you may find someone who can help you to resonate with your own inner voice. And, and we're talking towards good, because I'm not calling the inner voice, in this case, something that's going to go down the path of self-destruction. You lost contact with the inner voice, that is life positive inner voice. So the creative voice is to step up, 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 do more, take more responsibility and create more and transcend everything you were yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So within the impulse to help others, um, should we aspire to helping the, let's say, the, the most afflicted or the most gifted? Well, it depends on whether or not that's in your karma. It depends on your business. Your heart can always be sympathetic to the afflicted. I mean, they're all around us. But if you're in, let's say, a particular occupation, you have to focus on that, master that, bring that to as high a level as you can. See? And then always be feeling sympathetic. We're not talking about you know, diminishing your sympathetic resonance with other beings. No, the, the, the beauty of evolution and stepping up is increasing your resonance with other beings. And, and thus feeling more compassionate, and then coming up with solutions for people. And the solutions take many forms. I mean, some people offer money, that helps. Some people have ideas, and that helps. Some people have music, and that helps. Some people have a living demonstration, and that helps. So whatever you have, you want to put it to good use in that way. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can always be a good example to the people around you. But you have to volunteer that. So you have to step up to that. And I think it's our heart nature that makes, makes us so heroic in the, in the face of disaster. I mean, it brings the real best of us, and it's sad that it has to take a disaster to that. 
It shows everybody's potential. It's already hard nature, for real. And then we cover it over. We, we seem to sort of lose, lose uh, let's say, some kind of a, um, function. We lose some function at that level, see, because we're so busy surviving and, and doing other things that are easily distracting or more preoccupationally appropriate for us. See, we have to be preoccupied with uh, our money, our children, our family, our materialism. So we've got to balance these things and make it all work if it's possible for you to do that. See? So you don't want to give up on heart at all. Never give up on the heart. See? You can give up on a lot of other things, other desires, but don't give up on the heart, man. See? Yeah. See? Trim down selfishness and become more compassionate if you can. Yeah. I've heard you before make the distinction between having to slow down and already being still. Mm -hmm. Yes. So already living in that hard place where you're... We are already living there. Yes. And some who are more in time and feel it, who are not there, might take a point to slow down a little bit, relax more, and see if they can catch up with their, their stillness. It's always present. <laughs> it's never not there. Because without the stillness, you have no, no functioning, no life. Right. It's core stillness. Yeah. It's heart stillness. Yeah. It's divine stillness. Silence. For many people, it's what Zen is all about. See, recovering their sense of silence. See, not so much as a thing, but as a way. Good.